It's a very big thrill to be here. Uh, and speaking of thrills, I, I have to start with a, 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 what is called a joke. Uh, it was the French Revolution, and they were going to execute a bunch of scientists the next morning. Uh, in one cell was some biologists, and next cell was some physicists, and they were sort of passing the time, and the physicist said, before they execute me, I want to explain my latest theory of biology. And there was a big banging on the wall. <laughs> the biologist said, guards, guards, I want to be executed right now. <laughs> <laughs> so you like that? I'll tell you one more. Uh, <laughs> then I have to do something serious to earn my air ticket. Uh, it, it, it was, now the execution is happening. And they put the hood on. Put another hood. Is it not a joke now with ISIS, I guess? But <laughs> it sounds too much like ISIS. They put the next hood on. They put the next hood on. And the, and the guillotine drops but stops halfway down. And the physicist jumps up and pulls off his hood and says, I think I can fix that. <laughs> anyway. Uh, so this is work not by me but by many collaborators. A uh, majority are my PhD students and graduate students, postdocs, uh, and the list is rather long. But uh, uh, the important thing is I'll try to keep this talk fairly broad brush because the details are on a website and you don't write that down. You just Google my name and you'll learn more about me than I wanted my mother to learn. She's 95 now, but a few years ago she learned to use the computer. And she calls me up one night very late, very agitated, and she said, I Googled you. And you never told me about this, that, and the other. I said, well, I don't, I don't have to. She said, yes, but you were giving a talk in Philadelphia, only 20 miles from where I am, and you never visited me. <laughs> so that's a Jewish mother for you, you know. <laughs> OK. So, uh, but it, it also brought uh, some handouts, uh, so now you can run away. But uh, and they're heavy. I don't want to carry them back on the red eye. Okay. So uh, there's somebody I really want to thank, and that's the organizers, Joey, who led me through a lot of uh, ups and downs of things, uh, uh, Sui, and uh, of course uh, Leroy Hood, and uh, and the ISB in general. And uh, the title of this is. Uh, uh, not perfectly clear what to call it, but I've used this title now for many, many, many years. In fact, since 1971, when I wrote the book that was alleged to as a postdoc, I've been fascinated that things can switch without a switch. You know, I switched on the computer. It went on, actually, usually not. You throw a few more switches, and ultimately, it usually goes on. But there's some deterministic control. Uh, also, when you do an experiment, uh, it's reproducible. Uh, everybody said it, the Journal of Non-Reproducible Results was a joke for people whose work like mine is sometimes not reproducible. But we've learned today, and of course it's true, that many things are not reproducible simply because they're near a tipping point. And uh, the system is switching from one thing, one something or other, to another. And we'll talk about that in some detail. Uh, so let's go on. Uh, we'll start with a story not in France, but in Italy. And uh, it's not a joke. Uh, it is a story about what happened uh, on the 17th of September, 2003. Italy, as usual, was a happy place. Uh, cafes were overflowing, restaurants were good, and everything else. And uh, a colleague of mine was here in Rome uh, so, and enjoyed it so much, he brought his date back the next night and uh, just started the dinner when the lights went out. And the lights went out uh, for, uh, it doesn't matter, they have candles. So he had a good time. Uh, he remembers it more than anyone else probably. But then the miracle happened. Not only the lights went out in Rome, but within seconds, the, the lights went out in all of Italy. Uh, why is not clear but for a while. But a few years later, uh, a, a reason was given, which we hope is correct, because it's the motivation for this work. Namely, that <coughs> when the power in Rome went out, 
the computer in the SCADA network, of course it's not in the sky, it's just drawn that way, the, the network uh, had to go out also. Computers can't run without power. And when that computer went out, other computers who were linked to it went out. And a second later, uh, 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 more went out, and more went out, and more went out, and uh, pretty soon uh, the power uh, was uh, cut off to all of Italy, it dropped below the threshold, and all southern half of Italy lost power. Uh, oh, no. Better use your pointer. is an important example because the paper on which much of this work is based, uh, we submitted to Nature, pretty arrogant thing to do, but our group had 41 papers, and the students expected me to get this one in, and it, it got uh, uh, okay reviews for science, but they said it has nothing to do with the real world. Uh, so that was a challenge. I told the student, if you can find it, an example, maybe you'll get in, and he found this example. The student's name was Jerry Paul. Okay, we later learned that there are many examples of interdependent networks. Uh, uh, here is a cartoon uh, long before our 2010 paper by, uh, so uh, it's hard to read, transportation, oil, electric power, natural gas, water, and everything. And this was appreciated long before our work, uh, not only by uh, cartoonists like this, <coughs> but also by the government. The government of the USA uh, is responsible for things that we read about every day, but we usually don't read about uh, the anxieties of, uh, of sustainability under attack. We learn about sustainability under all the things that are very calm and slow that we can do something about. But <clears throat> it was fully appreciated that uh, civilized countries, all of them, not just Italy, are uh, sustained by a system of systems uh, of interlocking and interdependent infrastructures. And the vulnerability of the whole is greater than the sum of the vulnerability of the parts because of this interdependency. In other words, the computer needed the, the SCADA network, uh, needed the power grid, and the power grid needed the SCADA network. And most important for our grant, <laughs> they appreciated that there is no modeling and simulation tools to adequately address the consequences. So we got a pile of money from, I should thank the sponsor, DTRA. And this is an example where actually the idea to do this uh, was not mine. And it was not DTRAs. Uh, every one of you who has a grant know that the grant monitor has a nasty little habit of visiting from time to time to see what you did with the money. And this wonderful monitor named Robin Burke was not only uh, persistent, but she was smart. And so we did what we always do. The students rehearse 20 minute talks for a month before, and they're perfectly able to give everything. And at the end of the day, we said to her, Robin, what do you think of it all? Have we done well by you? He said, no, everything is networks. Network this, network that, network that, network this. Don't you know that networks interact? And we said, do they? I <laughs> never thought about that. And then I thought for a minute, because if a physical system of molecules does not interact, you don't get a liquid. A world without oil solid, a world that's only gas, uh, ideal gas, even worse, would not even remotely resemble the world we live in. And the same is true of networks. All networks interact with one another. So we set to studying this, and we wanted to make her a co-author. Uh, you know, professors are sometimes co-authors when all they do is suggest the problem and not much more, but she refused. But we made out well. We started by studying the simplest possibility, two networks. You can think of the red as the power grid, and you can think of the blue as the SCADA computer network, and the key point is interdependency. That's not just a link, if it was just an ordinary link, it would be just one big network with two kinds of, uh, uh, of uh, nodes, red nodes and green nodes, but the link is a dependency link, meaning that if the, if the uh, a, a node in the green network uh, fails to function, uh, uh, the corresponding node in the red no network also will not. And uh, uh, this is not only relevant for 
what DTRA cared about, but it's relevant for almost everything. The economy, we all think of as just a bunch of fat cats making gambles on Wall Street, unregulated by and large, but that's not true. There, Every network interacts with every other network. And uh, some of you know uh, that uh, one particular firm uh, made a bad guess, even though they had a Nobel laureate leading them, uh, uh, long-term capital management, and, uh, and they were uh, about to go under, uh, but they didn't tell anybody except their friends. And the friends all agreed to meet on a Saturday, which never, never happens. So the leaders of all the big investment banks met on a Saturday and said, what can we do? And they agreed there's nothing you can do. It's going to go under on Monday. So they all reached into their pockets and contributed money to save their competitor. Why why'd they do that? Restaurants, if I run a restaurant and my competitor goes under, I rub my hands because I get all his customers or her customers. And uh, the reason they did is they know the instability of the economic system to the breakdown of any individual uh, a unit inside it. And that's a very classic case. There's even a, a popular book about it if anyone wants to read. Physiology is also very dramatic. And since the meeting of our biology, uh, you probably know that the body is not just a big body, a big machine, but it's composed of many networks, a nervous system network, a renal network, a hormone network, and so forth. And the uh, 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 failure of one network affects uh, uh, all the other networks. A, a very dramatic example happened with my 92-year-old uh, father-in-law who lived uh, in an apartment very safe apartment, and slipped and fell one day and broke his hip. And of course, we rushed him to hospital, Beth Israel, where Eric Goldberg is a, a, a doctor. And they said, no problem. We'll f do a surgery tomorrow morning. They did. He was shipped out of there a few days later. He came to Thanksgiving dinner a couple of weeks later. And then two weeks after that, he suddenly died. And we didn't know what to do. Do we sue Eric Goldberg's hospital or what? You know, what's going on there? And I talked to a, a, a gerontology expert named Lou Lipschitz uh, about the remote possibility that just when we were doing this work, that the uh, perturbation on the hip, that one thing, uh, messed up the, the synchrony of all the networks of the body. Uh, and uh, Because by then I had read up on this, and it turns out if you do an autopsy on such people, uh, all the organs work. Everything's perfect. Makes no sense at all. It's like if your car stops working, they can usually find out what part is not working. But here there's no, no way to find out. And uh, uh, Lipschitz uh, agreed that this is uh, probably the case. So a, a member of our center, Plamen Ivanov, has uh, uh, now worked and published in Nature Communications a very nice article about the networks of the body and how interdependent they are. So uh, this is... Uh, 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 and then you, we all know that in, 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 uh, in biology, functions are performed by a network of different things. Okay, uh, we can skip this. So the big question is how do you get data? Especially if everything works. I, I'm fascinated by my father-in-law's experience, but I don't know where to start to analyze it. Not because he died, I mean, he's died, but I just don't know what to do. And if you do an, we didn't do an autopsy, but if you did an autopsy, we were told everything was working. So uh, what do you do about that? So uh, we decided to study something for which we have data. And that's because basically I'm not a theorist like the previous speaker. I, I'm a simple uh, boy from Oklahoma who looks at data and asks one and only one question, are these data telling us anything at all? And if so, what is it? And of all things to look at, I looked at economic data. I hate economic data. This was the part of the newspaper that I always grabbed first. And, so, and I put it in the, in, the, in the bathroom where the kitty litter box is. <laughs> it's all it was good for. And, uh, but uh, 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 it, it turns out, why are they printing a quarter of the newspaper on all these little data? You know, the jobs of data, you know, it depends on which newspaper, of course, but they all have a huge amount of data. And the answer is all the data are recorded, and everyone assumes that, <coughs> that these data are of interest. Usually just pieces of the data. If I own Apple, then of course I want to know if it's, it's doubled again or halved again or whatever's going on. But <coughs> some people look at all of it as much as they can. So 
uh, we decided to look at data. And the wonderful thing now that distinguishes situation from five, 10 years ago is that every trade, every transaction is recorded with all possible information about it. That means how many shares were traded, exact time to uh, centiseconds, to 10, 10 or 100 millisecond accuracy, and so forth and so on. And uh, so there's a huge amount of data, and it's sitting there. And all the laws of economics that you study were based on theories, because economists are applied mathematicians and make brilliant theories. They're far better in math than any physicist I know. However, they don't look at data first. And not their fault. There were no data when they got their education. They don't even look at data ever. Now that there are data, they hire someone to look at it. You probably know a classic case at Harvard where a professor uh, 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 had his uh, technician uh, doing all the data. Technician made a mistake on a spreadsheet. Uh, they published the wrong paper. That's already bad. This happens in physics. All of us have had a wrong paper, or at least something wrong in a paper, I hope. Not the only one. And, uh, uh, but the catch is, the difference is, because it's so important, uh, it, it though Congress, and Congress started acting on this, and then other countries heard about this and started acting on this, all a piece of, of wrong calculation. So the physicists are slowly taking over economics. For example, Wall Street hires physicists far and away more than anyone else, uh, and I know this for certain because I teach a course in econophysics, a new field of physics, which means just looking at economic data and theories through a eye view of a, a physicist. And uh, why do they do that? Because physicists don't come with preconceived mathematical notions, but they come with uh, the the uh, things that we learn in physics, which is to face a problem and try to solve it even though in advance we know we probably cannot solve it. And uh, so we stare at it and stare at it and stare at it and we finally ask someone else and they've been staring at it too and they collaborate and then another person joins and sometimes the whole class is working and sometimes they do get it and that's exactly what you need on Wall Street because the company wants to solve the problem. And so that's what's, what's going on. So I, I was very fortunate that our group is in Boston. And uh, most of you know Boston's maybe not as nice as Seattle, but it's one of the nicest cities on, on Earth. Uh, we're, we call it the Athens of America. And Christmas vacation was coming up. And fortunately, uh, many countries in Europe take long Christmas breaks. I got a letter from a student of Kurt Binder named Tobias Price. And he wanted to come at Christmas. And I said, not so enthusiastic. Many other people are coming. I won't have much time. And he said, yes, but let me tell you something. I have 13 million data. And I said, there are data is a million. We analyzed 200 million. He said, no, I have very special data. I have every transaction for a given thing, every transaction. Uh, that means uh, not many things mixed together, just one thing and every transaction. And I said, oh, yeah, when can you come? <laughs> he came. And of course, he had no idea what to do with this data. So it's the paradigm I told you. You look at data and you say, are they telling us anything? They could be telling us nothing special. It goes up and it goes down. But we looked at it and looked at it. And when you don't know what to do, you make a plot. And these are the data on one time scale of a day from here to there. And then there's a, an hour, and then there's a, 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 a half a day, and then uh, there's uh, 10 minutes. I think, on the bottom. Now, uh, there's nothing surprising there. You know, things that go up come down. <laughs> However, uh, there, we color-coded it. And you can guess what the colors are. The blue circles are local maxima, and the red circles are local minima. And to know what's a maximum minimum, you have to have a threshold window, which you can tune. But whatever you do, you have all these little windows. Now, why do we do that? Because I have many nasty physicists friends. Physicists like to be unfriendly and tough to each other. And one of the nastiest is Itamar Procaccia, to whom I could dedicate this talk. Because every time he heard me talking about economics, he said, you guys are so, so useless. Because why don't you tell us about when bubbles crash? And because look what happened to poor Isaac Newton, who was the first econophysicist. He invested in the South Seas, and many of you know he lost all his money. Okay, that's not so unusual. But he was totally flabbergasted how that could happen, and he made a very famous quote. He said, I have learned how to understand the motion of the planets, the motion of the Earth, but I can't understand economics. <laughs> and, uh, and so uh, so we tried to see if they're telling us anything. And uh, 
and a way to answer Procaccia. So the first thing, of course, is that the big crashes that hurt poor Isaac Newton in the South Sea bubble are uh, relatively rare. There are not many of them. It's like if you want to study earthquakes, someone could say, why do you have these little earthquake stations all over the world? Why don't you just have uh, the big ones, which may not even need an earthquake station for? I was in one last year in Tashkent. You don't need an earthquake station. <laughs> you know it's there. And uh, so, uh, uh, and and uh, so, uh, so so what do you need this for? And uh, and the answer is a, a faith, an article of faith that fluctuating systems uh, uh, fluctuate for a reason, and the reason is the same on one scale or another. And uh, most of you know that in earthquakes, and we have a world expert sitting right in front of me, Gene Carlson, obey statistical laws that show you the big earthquakes, the ones that we're all afraid of, obey the identical laws as the little ones. And that's important because if, there are not many big ones you can study. There are lots of little ones you can study. And that's important for various other reasons. And we, f we found that in fluctuations are exactly the same. I, I won't show you all this data, but the important thing, we had confidence that these data may be telling us something. So uh, we said, what are they telling us? Well, we have no idea. <laughs> so we turned to the comic books. This is actually the cover of The Economist, uh, roughly uh, that period. And we said, ah, there's the answer. Cartoons often have an answer. What's the answer? So here's traders on the old days when there was a trading floor, and one of them over the phone says, I have a stock that could really excel. The next one hears him, excel, excel, excel. There's a little uh, bad hearing on the part of this old guy. And he says, sell, <laughs> he misses the X. And the next one hears sell, and then they all, they all get that. And there's a cooperative spreading. And they all sell, 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 sell until one says, this is madness, can't take it anymore, goodbye, goodbye, bye. It says, bye. And then the other one understood that as B-U-I, not B-Y-E. And the same thing happens over again, and they buy. In other words, there's a, there's a cooperative interaction. Of course, there are no trading floors, but there's exactly the same thing because everything's on a computer. And the job of a trader is to study those fluctuations and to guess when is the right time to sell and when is the right time to buy. Uh, why do they care so much? Because every day, unlike my job, every day uh, your boss knows exactly what you earned and lost, your profit and loss for the day. It's posted. And if you're not doing so well, at the end of the week, uh, the boss uh, on your cubicle and says, Mr. Stanley, we really appreciate your work. You're incredibly smart, and you're really a nice guy, and you're funny, funny, very funny. But the only problem is <laughs> your profit and loss shows that you're costing our company money. You're supposed to be making our company money. So and you see behind this guy in blue, and you say, who's he? He's, he's a plain coast policeman, and he's just going to escort you out so you don't get angry and break all our computers, uh, which, of course, is what I would do <laughs> if I'd been fired. So uh, this happens every Friday, and, and my son works there. That's why I know all these stories. And uh, so that's real pressure. So, uh, uh, so th there's a real panic, in other words, when you're doing electronic trading to try to guess the right times to buy and sell. So now let's look back at this data, only this time. This time, we're going to same data. It doesn't matter. They all look alike. Uh, uh, but... Uh, uh, and this time, we're going to plot two things. We're going to plot the time between trades, every trade, not the max and the minimum, but every trade. And we're going to plot the volume of that trade. You know, did they sell 1,000 shares, 10,000 shares, or what? Now, just thinking about it, you would imagine just when the market's uh, uh, about to turn around, everybody's busy doing something. They want to get rid of this stock if they're smart and don't want to get fired. And, and uh, vice versa, when it's turning around down here, the, the, everyone wants to buy back in, just like in the cartoon. You see, you learn from the cartoon. And, and, uh, and, and so you imagine the volume would have peaks at these turning points. And, Conversely, the trading time should be very short because every trade, a trade, a trade, a trade, and you know the machines execute trades very fast. So uh, the, the uh, time between trades has a dip and the volume has a rise. So what? Up to now, qualitative statements, everybody, every trader, the dumbest trader in the world who gets fired the first week could know that. But the huge difference of a physicist, in my opinion, is they 
they make plots. They simply make a plot, make a graph. So suppose we make a graph. This is just the schematic of the same thing. Oh, this is the answer to Picaccio. There are trends. You see there's a, a, a trend uh, going down, a trend going up of this quantity, the volume. But it, that didn't, not saying anything new. Let's go to the next. Uh, so we make a plot of the volatility. And what does it look like? A Greek letter lambda. And when does everybody in this room see the Greek letter lambda? Of course, in Greek. But where else do you see it in physics? You see it at a lambda phase transition, where what the classic thing that's plotted is the specific heat of helium, because it's very easy to measure very close to a critical point. And specific heat is nothing more than the measure of fluctuations in entropy. So the entropy fluctuations in helium are doing this, and so also the volume has these huge fluctuations. And the reverse for the trade times, intertrade times, that has the huge dip. This we already commented on, the dip, but now the dip is, is, uh, is uh, so to speak, average, maybe you'll believe it. But now here's the main surprising thing, one more plot. This is a simple plot. In high school, we learned to plot everything in sight. But in, in graduate school, I learned to plot everything in sight on two kinds of paper, linear paper from high school and log-log paper. So let's plot the same things on log-log paper. And lo and behold, the data are straight. Not as, uh, they're as straight as they were in critical phenomena before people went crazy and tried to make it bigger range. Uh, and it's straight enough to estimate the slope. There are two slopes depending on whether you're approaching from the left or the right of this singularity. And similarly, <coughs> the intertrade times, and uh, here there's uh, two slopes, uh, they're roughly the same. But I emphasize only about little more than one factor of 10. But still that's very dramatic because when something's straight, it must mean something. So, uh, in my opinion, so uh, uh, we said, well, maybe this is just an artifact of, of this particular data set, or maybe it's because the data is on such a fine scale. So do the same thing all over again, but for a longer scale, for many, many years. Uh, uh, actually, there's only 100 days here. Uh, analyzing uh, the S&P 500, and you see roughly the same slope for the uh, uh, for the uh, volatility, and similar for the volume, uh, 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 roughly the same difference, factor of two, uh, that's what we found with the small data, and a similar difference here for the, the macroscopic data. And the difference between the time scale of 10 millisecond, uh, the smallest time scale, and to be as price data, up to the large 100 days, is nine orders of magnitude. So when something holds over nine orders of magnitude, you think maybe there's really something there. There's not just mumbo jumbo. You know, the joke to everybody when you give talks is that, you know, everything's straight on log dog paper, ha ha ha. What have you proved? But that's just not true you know, in many examples when it's not straight. That's why I plot everything both ways. So this was a very big excitement because it's exactly like helium. Here's the famous helium plot of Buckingham Fairbank that helped launch the critical phenomena uh, a craziness of the second half of the of last century, and sucked me into the field. Uh, and uh, this is specific heat of helium, you know, entropy fluctuations of helium, as a difference from the uh, from the uh, 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 critical point. And you see it goes up and comes down. And the shape is roughly a lambda shape. That's why it's called lambda transition. And then you can do it all over again, only now in milli degrees, and you get a lambda. You can do it in micro degrees, and you get a lambda. So this is a, a famous plot just because it emphasizes that the data are scale invariant. You get the same answer on six orders of magnitude difference in scale. So that's very, uh, very uh, means that the stock market fluctuations are similar. No, I have five more. You can sit down. No, if you stand there, if you stand there, I think I have zero more. I'm used to people jumping up and down. That means I'm in negative numbers. <laughs> so if you stand up, I know jumping comes next. <laughs> so, okay, now I'm going to conclude, but it'll take five minutes, uh, with, uh, 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 with uh, tipping points in a system that I know and love, which is water. Uh, water has a famous critical point at 373 
uh, Celsius, 647 Kelvin, and so forth. Uh, but it also has probably a second critical point at very low temperatures separating two kinds of water, a high density water and a low density water. To prove this is very difficult, it's hard to do experiments in that range without perturbing the water somehow. So then a purist, particularly chemists who dominate water, says, that's not water, that's confined water. <laughs> Forgetting that confined water is the basis of biology and so forth and so on. But the point is, this is not 100% true that there is a critical point. So what I've been trying to do for the last 25 years is find reasons to believe it is. And what is this? This is actually computer water. And this is a phase diagram with pressure on the y-axis, temperature on the x, and here is a line of first-order transitions, a critical point, and the Widom line above, above in temperature. Now, if you don't know what Widom line is, it means the locus of maximum fluctuations. Uh, I named it Widom line to honor Ben Widom. What's that streak there? Is that you? You put that streak in my graph and <laughs> get me to finish. I never saw that before. Okay, so, uh, and these little X's are where the, where the uh, calculations were done. Now, we learned in school that the near critical points, we learned in school that in a first order transition, on one side there's all one phase, and on another side there's an all another phase. And the system jumps from one phase to the other phase. It's either liquid or gas, for example. And uh, that's just not true, simply not true. If the system is far from the critical point, it's not completely true, but it's almost true, but near the critical point, there are massive public uh, fluctuations, as we saw in the Buckingham Fairbank Keller graphs. There were singularities and fluctuations as big on one side as on the other side. And the same is true here. So in the liquid phase, uh, the fluctuations are as big as in the gas phase. It's actually two liquids, doesn't matter. So huge fluctuations. And above the critical points, exactly the same. The critical exponents that describe those fluctuations are symmetric. So the critical point is, is, is a, a, a little bit ill-defined. It means if you wait forever and do enough averages, you can see that this is a liquid. And the other one's a gas. Okay, so let's see what the data show. So here's a simulation as a function of time, times in nanoseconds. Remember, uh, we, uh, and uh, with a computer, the time is very short. And we're very near the critical point, but on the first order region. So I was taught, as I say, the system's in one phase or the other phase, depending on whether the left or the right of the first order line. As we see here, they're just the opposite. The system jumps from being mostly one phase to mostly another, then goes back, and it goes back like, like human relations, you know, when you're breaking up with a partner or something, you know. You try breaking up, and then you go back, and you go back, and go back, and so forth. And, uh, and uh, if we may shine a light bulb from the left, we see a histogram that has two peaks, one around the density of one peak, uh, one phase, and the other around the density of the other phase. And if we look as a function of time, uh, the blue balls represent the low density phase, and you see they form very tiny clusters. The correlation length is roughly the size of these little clusters. And the red ones form small clusters also. And now look what happens when time goes. This is only five, 20 more nanoseconds, <laughs> and don't do any of this stuff with the cars. <laughs> it made me nervous. Uh, so you see, it's, if you think of the blue as Democrats and the red as Republicans, uh, because that's roughly what it is, the community influence each other, and the system switches from Democrat to Republican, and then it's going to switch back again, I hope. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, it'll come back. It will come back, come back. <laughs> there. They took away Obamacare, they took everything away. And this is, this is exactly what sociology is too. In other words, people interact with one another just like the molecules. And as a function of time, one nanosecond less, uh, they jump from one state to the other when asked a question, who are you going to vote for? And we're seeing it right now, where so many people say they'll vote for the other party without necessarily knowing why. Networks attacked and repaired undergo dramatic change in their activity depending on the degree of interdependency of the neighboring nodes. And that's my main message. Very simple. Thank you. Thank you.